Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Once again, we are back to this course on convex optimization. Yesterday, if you had remembered, uh, we had just spoken about these facts that we have proved what is called the Rockefeller Shenichni condition, which is a necessary and sufficient optimality condition for a convex function f to be minimized over a convex set c. Of course, you have, we have proved that it is necessary and the sufficiency is left as a homework to you, which you can do. Today, we are going to go back a bit more and use this power of the convex calculus that is how we, we will see how we can exploit the max function. We had uh, spoken yesterday about the max function, if I can just go back uh, here. Here we have spoken about the sub differential of a max function where each of the individual f's which make up the max function that is max of f i x f i x that is this f 1 x f 2 x f m x each are convex and differentiable and this function f is also convex which is already well known which we have spoken earlier. Then the sub differential just a moment is this. So, today we are going to see that okay, if I have to minimize a convex function f x over x element of c, but this time my c is defined by inequality constraints. And each of these constraints are themselves convex. So, I assume that this is f is convex and differentiable. and g i x are also convex and differentiable. Let me assume that this has a minimum, let x bar. So, this is my convex programming problem C p and let x bar solve C p. So, x bar is feasible that it satisfies all g i x bar is less than 0 and for every x which satisfies these constraints, f of x is bigger than f x bar. That is the mean, meaning of f x bar solves C p in the global sense. Of course, for a convex problem, there is no local minimum. Of course, you can convince yourself that this set C, which is a feasible set of the program of the programming problem C p, is a convex set. Once I know that all the functions g i s are convex. In fact, it is also a closed set because each of the g i s are defined from r n to r and any function defined from r n to r is any convex function defined from r n to r is a continuous function. Now, so what information I have about this is convex and closed. Now, once I know these facts, then I uh, look into the following problem. So, if x bar is solving this problem C p, then x bar also solves mean f x subject to x element of R n, where f capital F of x is the convex function given by max of f x minus f x bar g 1 x g m x. You can try out again as a homework to prove this fact that whenever x bar solves this problem, x bar will solve this problem. Now, of course, all of these are convex functions, so capital F is a convex function.
So, as homework you figure out is f continuous and y. Now, once I know this, I can immediately write down the optimality condition that 0 belongs to del of f of x bar. Now, f is a max function, then I can calculate the optimality conditions by applying the calculus rule for max functions. Now, once I know this, what shall happen? How do I now calculate the j x bar? set corresponding to f. So, corresponding to my function f, how do I calculate the index set j x bar? In order to do so, I uh, look into this fact that okay, consider all index i, okay, let us consider all index, consider i which belongs to any one of these indexes such that g i x bar is equal to 0. So, if you take some i which for which this is satisfied, these constraints are called constraints which are active at x bar. So, this would imply one important phenomena, uh, important thing that I will collect corresponding to x bar all the indexes i belonging to this index set that is this is one among the constant indexes such that g i x bar. Now, if you look at this function, if I put f x equal to f x bar this becomes 0 and for all the active indexes that is for all i belonging to the i x bar, I would immediately have g i x bars are also equal to 0. So, when x is equal to x bar, and for all other x's, g i x is strictly less than 0. So, f of x bar is actually 0. So, this is something you have to be very carefully noting down that f of x bar is actually 0. And this 0 is achieved at this point, right, which I can write as g 0 if you want, g 0 x. So, this consists of j x consists of the index 0 as well as the active index set corresponding to x bar. So, j x bar consists of the index 0 union i x bar which is this. Once I know j x bar and I knowing that all these are differentiable, I know that 0 element of del f x bar which is equal to the convex hull of grad of f x bar this particular set union grad of g i x bar such that i is belonging to i x bar. So, which means you have to, so 0 must be an element of the convex hull of these elements of these sets. So, there would exist some lambda naught, lambda 1, lambda 2 dot dot lambda m all non-negative that is all greater than or equal to 0 such that you have 0 equals to lambda naught grad of f x bar plus summation i belonging to i x bar lambda i not I, I, I here I should not put lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda m here I should put lambda i with i belonging to i x bar that is makes correct sense lambda i grad g i x bar. Now, let us set lambda i is equal to 0 if i is not in i x bar that is 
whenever g i x bar is equal to 0, lambda i would be equal to 0. So, now I can write bring in this fact in a much simpler way. So, I can now put in lambda i is to be 0, I can just put 0, 0, 0 for all the i's which are not in i x bar, but then I have to account for this behavior of lambda i. So, there must be some additional condition that lambda i's are such that lambda i into g i x bar would be equal to 0. So, these would lead to the following condition that lambda naught grad f x bar plus lambda 1 grad. So, we have two conditions now grad g 1 x bar. So, I cannot just arbitrarily say that all the lambdas corresponding to uh, lambda i is uh, corresponding to g i x bar strictly less than 0 is 0. Once I have assumed that to give this full expression, then automatically a condition arises and that condition is at lambda i times g i x bar is equal to 0. That is both of them cannot have strict inequality at the same time. That is this cannot be strictly greater than 0, this cannot be strictly less than 0. This, this fact has to be always maintained by the Lagrangian multipliers or the Kuhn, the Kuhn Tucker multipliers as we will soon call them. But you, if you observe here, there is also one important thing which we have not stated. Now, these lambda naught lambda i's are ele elements forming a convex hull. So, an important thing that one should have stated here was that lambda naught plus summation i element of i x bar lambda i is equal to 1. So, basically 0 belongs to the convex hull of some set that which comes from the max function. Now, what does this mean? Each of them are greater than equal to 0, their sum is equal to 1. So, all of them cannot be 0 at the same time. So, for and of course, for i naught element of i x bar we have taken everything to be 0. So, what I would also have the third condition is that the vector lambda naught, lambda 1, lambda m is not a 0 vector. This is a very, very important condition and the condition that you get here is called the Fritz John condition or the John condition. Fritz John conditions or the just the John conditions. So, Fritz John presented his condition way back in 1948 and he submitted it to the Duke Journal of Mathematics, which was rejected and then published in a conference proceeding. Later on, Karush Kuntakar condition or the Kuntakar condition came from here in 1951. Now, let me assume something additional which I have not assumed earlier. Let me assume this fact that this set C, the feasible set has an interior. So, this is my additional restriction. Why I want to put this additional restriction? Note that I have said lambda naught lambda 1 lambda m, the whole vector is not equal to 0, but I did not say that lambda naught need not be 0, lambda naught could be 0 and if lambda naught is 0, then we are in a very, very bad situation that we have a problem where lambda naught is 0 and grad f which is gradient of the objective function it plays no role in the computation as a result of which uh, things might not turn out as it as you want to want it to. So, the representation of f goes immediately from the optimality condition which is not a fair thing. So, Kuhn and Tucker in 1951 impose certain conditions which are not now called the Kuhn Tucker constant qualification, which uh, we are not going to harp here. Uh, but an important assumption was given in 1952 by Slater, Slater condition, which says C A has an interior, the feasible set, which means there would exist an X set. So, he has why this condition is imposed, that condition is imposed to stop lambda naught from becoming 0. 
So, in the John conditions which is this three set of three conditions lambda naught could become 0 stopping the representation of uh, f from the expression in uh, f from the optimality conditions in in order to stop that that is in order not to make the optimality conditions look abnormal you have uh, this additional restriction to stop lambda naught from becoming 0. So, interiority means there exists an x hat in R n such that g i of x hat Now, once I know this, let me make an assumption like this and I will then show that lambda naught cannot be 0. Now, let lambda naught be equal to 0, even if Slater condition holds. Now, once you do this, when once you put lambda naught is 0, you will have lambda 1 grad g 1 x bar plus lambda m grad g m x bar is equal to 0. Now, observe that lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda m cannot be all 0 because lambda naught is 0. So, one of the one of the no, among the this vector is non zero. So, if lambda naught is 0, so the non zero vector non zero component must lie among lambda 1 to lambda m. Now, we know that whenever i is not in i x bar, lambda i's are anyway 0. So, I can write this as lambda i times gradient of g i x bar. So, i element of i x bar you see because lambda since lambda i is equal to 0 for i not in i x bar it would imply that this is equal to 0. Now, the non zero components must lie among these i belonging to i x bar because when i is not in i x bar anyway lambda i is 0. So, you have lambda naught 0 and all these are lambda is 0. So, remaining part the non zero component must appear. So, there is a non zero component here. Okay. Now, how can I use the Slater condition? Let us see. Now, for any i element of i x bar, g i x bar is strictly less than 0. Now, look at the convexity equation when functions are differentiable and look at this for this particular pair x hat and x bar, x hat is the point where the Slater condition is actually getting satisfied. And so, uh, this is bigger than gradient of g i x bar x hat minus x bar. Okay. Now, g i x bar is it for sorry I made a mistake when g i is i is in i x bar g i x bar is equal to 0. Sorry. So, g i x bar is 0 g i x hat is so what remains here in this expression Now, g i x hat is strictly less than 0. So, what I get from the above is gradient of g i x bar x hat minus x bar is strictly less than 0 for all i element of i x bar. Now, among these elements there is one lambda i which is non 0 at least one. So, if I multiply it by that lambda i with the corresponding this corresponding grad g i x hat minus x bar that would also remain to be a strictly negative quantity. So, that would imply in general when I multiply by the lambda for lambda i for each corresponding i and sum up what I will get is summation lambda i 
gradient of g i x bar i element of i x bar x at minus x bar is strictly less than 0. This is in contradiction with the fact that here I have this is equal to 0. So, if I take inner product with any vector, if I take the inner product of any vector with the 0 vector that will give me 0. So, but if I put this condition as the condition A, but from condition A we have So, here is a contradiction here is a contradiction. Now, once you have this contradiction, so you declare that okay, your initial hypothesis that lambda not lambda 0 is 0 is wrong and so we conclude that lambda naught is strictly greater than 0. So, now I have this equation lambda naught grad f x bar plus lambda 1, this is called the Lagrange equation or the KKT equation very Now, I know that lambda naught is strictly greater than 0, so I can divide both sides by lambda naught. So, I will call lambda i by lambda naught as lambda i bar. So, what I have proved that if Slater C q holds and this is of course, greater than equal to 0 because each of them is greater than equal to 0, this is greater than 0. If Slater condition holds, there exists lambda i bar greater than equal to 0 i from 1 to m such that number 1 grad of f of x bar plus lambda 1 bar grad g 1 x bar lambda m bar grad g m x bar is equal to 0 and number 2 is lambda i bar g i x bar is equal to 0 for all i. Now, this third condition in the Frisjohn one, this is no longer required because lambda naught I have proved to be strictly greater than 0. So, lambda naught lambda naught is basically 1. So, Frisjohn k k t condition is Frisjohn condition with lambda naught equal to 1. Under, so, this holds if you have some additional uh, condition. So, what we have got here is the famous uh, Karush Kuntakar condition, it now goes by the name of Karush Kuntakar condition. So, I think one of the first papers who possibly uh, gave this name Karush Kuntakar condition was a paper which call, was called the modern multiplier rules which appeared in 1980, 1980, 80 or 81 in the American uh, main mathematical monthly, it is called uh, modern multiplier rules. by p h 4 c 
Yao, American Math Monthly. It was beautifully written article and uh, it says uh, that uh, though Kuhn and Tucker had independently derived this condition. So, this was known to Karush way back in the mid uh, end, end of the 30s early 40s I guess. So, now it is called the Karush Kuntagar conditions or the KKD condition. It became famous uh, in the 1951 seminal 1951 paper by Kuhn and Tucker Har Harold W. Kuhn and Albert W. Tucker both from Princeton. It is very important to remember that uh, even if Karush had this idea slightly ahead that does not diminish the value or the worth of the Karush Kuhn Tucker or the, of the KKD condition or this paper uh, by Kuhn and Tucker because Kuhn and Tucker in that paper demonstrates with an example why a example where lambda naught becomes 0 and they did it even for just differentiable functions they found the necessary condition not as we have done for uh, convex functions and they did not talk about Slater condition which came slightly later they spoke about a general uh, geometrical optimality condition geometrical constant qualification or condition on the constraints which is called the Kuhn Tucker constant qualification. And furthermore this famous paper had also given results for multi objective optimization and that is also very important. So, this paper has a huge worth in the optimization community as Professor Harold Kuhn once told me that once he was inside a conference trying to he was told to introduce Professor Tucker and he said I am Kuhn and he is Tucker and that is all everybody knows what it is. So, now what we have got here is a necessary condition that you have given me a solution x bar and I showed the condition that x bar should satisfy provided the Slater condition holds. We will approach arrive at this condition through various routes. So, there are many many different paths to the Karush Kuntakar condition and you can immediately understand that 2011 was the 60 years of K KKD condition. Now, when the functions are convex, the question is, is this also necessary? That is, if there is an x bar and if there is some lambda bar which satisfies all this, is my, uh, I know whether that x bar is actually a global minimum. The answer turns out to be yes and uh, let us see how to do it. Look at, uh, look at the definition of a convex function when they are differentiable. Now, you have f x minus f x bar and this is of course, you know take any x in the feasible set in C. Now, take for any i for all i g i x minus say take the same x g i x bar is again for each i. Now, you can multiply by lambda i because lambda i is greater than or equal to 0. So, there is no harm in multiplying this set by lambda i and then once you multiply by, the, by lambda you add this inequalities what you will get is So, I am multiplying by lambda i bar sorry summation lambda i bar grad g i x bar i element uh, oh sorry i is equal to 1 to m i equal to 1 to m x minus x bar. Now, let us just apply these conditions. So, you know from this condition you, you it is immediate that this right hand right hand side is 0 because this is 0. So, what I have is f x minus f x bar plus summation lambda i bar g i x. So, minus summation lambda i bar g i x bar this 
this is greater than or equal to 0 and if you observe this second condition which is called the complementary slackness condition this is called the complementary slackness which says that both of them cannot be slack at the same time that is lambda i cannot be strictly greater than 0 and g i x also cannot be strictly less than 0 at the same time. Both of them can be 0 at the same time, but both of them cannot be having strict inequalities at the same time. So, now this is 0 from this condition, condition 2 this part is 0 is 0. So, what I will have is f x minus f x bar taking this thing to the other side now as x is in c that it is feasible g i x is less than equal to 0 for all i this would imply because lambda is is bigger than 0 i is equal to 1 to m lambda i bar g i x is less than equal to 0, but I have put a minus sign. So, what I would finally get is that this is greater than equal to 0. So, this would imply for all x in C because x was an arbitrary element in C f x minus f x bar is greater than equal to 0 showing that x bar is indeed the minimum. 